G'day and welcome to my preview of Broken Realms Kragnos. Uh, this is the fourth book of the Broken Realms series. Games Workshop was kind enough to send me this book and I got it a few days in advance compared to it hitting on the shelf. It's given me enough time to look at the War Scrolls, look at the rules and dissect it enough to give you a bit of a preview and a sneak peek of what's to come in the book. Now, as always, and be mindful that uh, FAQs are to come, and probably more than ever, we've got Age of Sigma 3rd Edition coming. So when I go through the rules and I go through some of the things that are being previewed, I guess I felt it quite difficult to prepare and understand truly the impacts of some of the War Scrolls. We saw updates to Alario. We saw an introduction of uh, a new mega hero in Kragnos. We've seen an update on uh, Lord Croak. There's been so many things that have changed that some of the things you just like, what's the real benefit? Am I paying too much for something? So I'll share with you the observations that I'm seeing for Age of Sigma 2, some things to consider for Age of Sigma 3, and uh, hopefully inspire some new list ideas for when the new book drops. So without further ado, let's actually have a look at what Broken Realms Kragnos is going to share with us. So Broken Realms Kragnos is going to give us a whole bunch of things, and much like the Broken Realm series that have happened before us, we've had Marathi, we've had Teclas, we've had Bellacor. Each of the books are a narrative supplement that's going to touch different armies in different levels. Sometimes you'll get big changes, sometimes you'll get minor changes. And the armies that are most impacted is going to be Destruction, and that is obviously through Kragnos being across the entire Grand Alliance of Destruction. You're also going to get new champions, new updates, new uh, a whole range of things. So Gloomspike Gits have a whole bunch of new allegiance abilities. When I say new, you know, it's like a highlight underline. If you didn't see the White Dwarf releases in 2020, um, you this would be new to you. There's a whole bunch of new rules for squigs, trogs, and for spiders. If you were a part of the White Dwarf rules in 2020, um, it is it is being brought over, and there are some updates to to the rules. If you are a Silver Death player, there's some cool stuff coming for yourself, both in a battalion form, an update to Alario, but also a new War Scroll. Uh, the Seraphon got the the Lord Croak, and uh, I think it was just Lord Croak. Um, Skaven got some new Allegiance abilities and got an update as well from a battalion. And we also got two War Scroll updates in the Beast of Chaos as well as a battalion. So there's a lot going on in this book. Let's actually have a look what you're going to get. In addition to Cities of Sigma, that's not there. But Cities of Sigma um, actually got a whole new city as well. It got the city of Excelsius, which um, is going to bring not just a new bunch of rules, but you've also got access to two new heroes, um, which is the the Van... The van um, Dance, I think it's called. Yep, the Van Dance. So you're going to get a whole bunch of new rules there as well. In addition to all the narrative stuff, um, I'm not going to spoil the narrative. Uh, I'm going to keep all of those spoilers, the realms of battle, um, all of the things that kind of come there, I'll, I'll avoid. So let's start off with the big daddy cool himself, the ender of the uh, the uh, empire, the Kragnos himself, big daddy cool as I've called him. So Big Daddy Cool is indeed cool, but he is coming in not only with a dense war scroll, but a big fat price of 760 points. And Kragnos is a massive model. He is the size of a mega gargant, um, and he's quite an imposing figure. So a very large base, very large model, and pretty cool if you ask me. He is able to be brought into any destruction army, which is which is going to be handy for some people, maybe less handy for others. But if you do bring him into your army, he can't benefit from the allegiance abilities, um, but he is treated as the general in addition to the model that you are choosing normally for your army. So that will come into a play for a few different reasons, and maybe AOS 3, it'll be worth even more. We've started seeing that as a theme um, Night Haunt has brought in a whole bunch of those types of rules. Um, other armies are, are starting to bring in certain named characters or certain heroes that are counted as general in addition. So we'll, we'll kind of keep that in mind. But for me, Kragnos 
is is coming to the army, loving his ABCs. And if you don't know your ABCs, it is always be charging. And Kragnos has 18 wounds. He has a two-up armor save, uh, 10 inch move. No mortal wound save, so he's got not going to have a damage prevention when it comes to, to wounds and mortal wounds after that two-up armor save, but he can ignore spells and endless spells. So a really cool rule with the shield is that if Kragnos is affected by a spell or an endless spell, you get to roll 3d6, and if that dice roll is greater than the casting value, he's going to ignore the spell completely, but that doesn't mean he can step over endless spells. So for things like Soul Snare Shackles, which um, could potentially pin Kragnos down, um, unlike a Mega Gargant who can step over, say, Soul Snare Shackles, um, you just get to ignore the effects, but the model is still there. So do keep that in mind. Uh, it is one of the quote-unquote counters that people have talked about very early on, despite him not hitting the tables just yet. But when you look at Kragnos's rules. It is, a, like I said, a very dense war scroll. I'm not going to put everything up on the page, but a couple of call outs that I would make is that, you know, he's quite brutal from a melee point of view. His profile is quite consistent. There's a lot of damage coming out of the profile. He's got range of, um, he's got a, 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 at least one range three attack. It's also got range three as well. So you can really expect some, uh, some heavy damage output from, I think it hits on threes and wounds on twos for the entire stat profile. So, you know, consistently it's going to do a lot of damage. On top of that, where you're probably going to see a lot of damage is what's on the screen here, which is the rampaging destruction ability. Kind of ties back into that always be charging rule because that's really what you want to be doing with Kragnos. And when you look at the rampaging destruction, there is two options. So basically, if Kragnos makes a charge move. Um, you get to either do one of two things. Option one is to roll a dice for each enemy unit within one inch of the model. And on a two plus, he's going to do D6 mortal wounds. It's a pretty big base, so that's going to be nice. If you charge a whole bunch of different woo or units or there's a couple of support heroes in addition to the, um, the, the unit that you're charging, you could potentially do a lot of damage. You're kind of spreading it out. Option two, and probably the one you're going to see more of, is you uh, if you if you charge and you charge into an enemy monster. So if there's an enemy monster within one inch, you roll two dice, and if you roll a seven, a combined seven, nothing happens when you roll those two dice. For any other roll, you get to roll. Uh, you basically multiply the dice together, and that is the amount of mortal wounds that you do to the monster. So let's say, for example, um, I roll two sets of sixes, which is obviously the best I can do on 2d6. Um, six times six is 36, so that would be 36 mortal wounds. The likelihood of Kragnos doing like 36 mortal wounds on the charge is I think statistically like 2% or 3%. It's not very high. Um, so it sounds like it could swing quite high. But at the same time, if I roll a 3 or a 5, that's 15 mortal wounds. If I roll a double 1, that's one mortal wound. Being a destruction player, especially a Gits player, you know that the pendulum can swing. For, you know, for, for the likelihood of doing 36, it also can swing the other way. So do keep that in mind. But when Kragnos does charge, he will do potentially a lot of mortal wounds or a lot of damage, and then he has a very generous attack profile. On top of that, you're going to get some cool bravery things, and for some armies, bravery is not going to be that important. I know for my Gloom Spike Gits, I'm thinking about maybe how I can tap into the plus one bubble in addition to the damage output that Craggy is going to do. Uh, yeah, that's right. I call him Craggy. I'm going to have Scraggy, Scraggot the Loon King, and Craggy Kragnos. And um, but for most for most destruction armies, you're probably not going to build a strategy around plus one bravery. We don't know if Inspiring Presence is going to change. We are seeing a whole bunch of new armies with new models with bravery benefits. So we don't know what's coming in AOS 3. I wouldn't build a strategy around it, but plus one bravery is nothing to, to sniff your nose at. 
there are some interesting rules and I mentioned earlier at the start that there are some things that don't quite make sense. And there are two things on Craig Noss's war scroll that don't quite make sense just yet. One is the ability to destroy terrain, especially when it comes to what's called defensive terrain. And we don't have defensive terrain in, in Age of Sigmar 2. So that could be a rebrand of garrisoning. It could be something more. Keep your eyes on that for, for AOS 3. But then there's another rule that talks about um, if he, if he, I think it's in charge or if he's in range or if he's in combat or I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, but um, you get a, a really nice boost when you are handling or you're up against Star Drakes, Drake, uh, Dracoth, and Dracoline keywords. So, you know, there's not a lot of Star Drakes in, on the tabletop right now. Stormcast are not really taking it. I haven't really seen a Dracoth, Dracoline, or a Drake for some time now, but who knows what is going to be in the Stormcast, the third edition version of Stormcast Eternals. Maybe it is very Drake orientated, and this could be a really nice counter to Stormcast. We don't know yet. In addition, I am recording this video um, when Games Workshop have previewed the new hero and monster reactions. So there's going to be some nice little boosts that you can apply to Kragnos potentially, and there might be all stuff coming down the line. You know, I when I thought about this particular war scroll, um, I had a really tough time understanding how to make the most of him because and it, it may, maybe you know, as an opponent, maybe I'll flip the switch here and think about if I was going to run Kragnos, um, if an if I'm if my opponent doesn't have a lot of rend or it doesn't have a lot of access to mortal wounds, especially mortal wounds that come from abilities, because if you're throwing mortal wounds from spells and endless spells, I have a really good chance to ignore those. But if they're coming from things like let's say the Celestial Hurricanum, which is mortal wounds from an ability. If I don't have those as an opponent, I'm going to really bring the pain. It's going to be really hard to take down this large amount of wounds on a very durable armor save. Now, if I don't have access to screens, um, there's a good chance that Kragnos is going to charge into the good stuff and, again, do a whole bunch of, of, of wounds. And I think screening is going to be important. Kragnos doesn't fly, so, um, you know, chaffing up the board well, yeah, he'll do potentially mortal wounds and a whole bunch of them, but every time he's not getting into the good stuff, um, and and Iron Jaws players know that the more Crusher and probably the more Crusher flies, so that's a a bit of a bit of a help for for um for the more Crusher. But you know, every chance that you're not charging is really a missed opportunity to do significant damage, especially if there is a monster. Um, on the flip side, as I've mentioned, you know, if for things like having high rend, um, if you can charge first, whether it's you're a low drop, whether you have a 3d6 charge, um, there are some things that can really kind of bring Kragnos down. So if you are going to invest almost 800 points or maybe almost half of your army, you really start to need to think about how can I heal him? Uh, he has no native way of healing. So do you need Emerald Life Swarm? Um, are there ways to get him into the fight earlier, whether it's going to be through Chronomatic Cogs? What can I do to, to make the most of Kragnos on the table? Again, a big point sink. Um, Archeon players, Nagash players, um, Marathi players will know what it's like to build a list around those benefits. But as I mentioned, third edition is coming. There could be some hidden gems right now for me. Kragnos, uh, it, it's a hard challenge. If I was a destruction player um, with my Gits, for example, I guess the question that I've got for myself is, do I take a Mega Gargan Mercenary or do I bring Kragnos? The Mega Gargan is cheaper. Uh, what are the rules that are being brought on the table? If I was looking for this damage output, it's a good scroll. You've got really got to find a way to justify it. And I think for most people, though, there's just going to be better options within, uh, again, a more Crusher, a Mega Gargant, a uh, stone horn, something's going to be a lot cheaper that could do similar things that you wanted to do. But look, let's see what happens with third edition. I'm not ready to write it off just yet, but for, for almost 800 points, it's a big question mark on how do I make the most of Kragnos. Talking about destruction armies, we do have our Gloom Spike kits, and the first thing I'll mention is that the Lunar Shrine has had an update. So 
Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, pr- uh, the white dwarf rules from – there were three different white dwarfs, right? There was uh, – and so that's why I say generically the 2020, right? Because in, it was 2020 that they brought one month was focused on something called the Jaws of Mork, which is all about additional rules for squigs, et cetera, et cetera. Previously, your your uh, your loon shrine, which is the terrain piece for Gits, only focused on stabbers and shooters. Yes, it gave a bravery um, a buff to to your army within twelve. Anything with gloom spike kit keyword, but basically, at the end of your turn, you could bring back um, a unit of stabbers and shooters, the the grots. Um, you could bring them back at half strength on a four plus, which was nice. But if I'm a trog player, it was useless. If I was a squig player, it was useless. What they've done with the 2020 expansions is each of those months brought in a different set of rules. So now what I can do is if my general is a spider fang general, so it's got a, it's got the spider fang keyword, an arachnorok spider, for example, a web spinner shaman, um, what it would allow me to do is I could bring back spider riders instead. So I don't get to bring back stabbers and shooters. My general is spider fang. It means uh, at the end of the battle round, uh, or at the, sorry, at the end of my turn, on a four plus, I can bring back spider riders at half of the unit size. I think it was rounding up. The same is true with squig. So if I'm a squig player, uh, I could bring back squig herds, squig hoppers, and boingrot bounders um, that were destroyed on a four plus, and they come back at half strength. They've got to be set up. Uh, I think it's wholly within twelve of the loon shrine. So you're bringing them back in your side of the table. Uh, the trog, the trog players again. If your your general is a trog keyword, you can bring back trogoth units. Now there is a little bit of a cleanup here. Um, there was a little bit of a hack where people um, people could bring back a trogoth hag, which is like a fourteen wound hero. People could bring them back. They've now cleaned up the keywording, and it is based on a trogoth unit that has a wounds characteristic of five or less. So you can't bring back your troll hag, but you will be able to bring back your uh, your fell waters, your rock guts, and your dank holds. So either way, regardless of how, how you pick your general, and if you're a Gits player, if you are actually focused around stabbers and shooters, you can still bring those back if your general is going to be, um, so you don't have you don't have to go down those routes. You can still bring back those guys. Talking about those rules, you also then had your jaws of mork, you had your glogs mega mob, and you had your your grim scuttle tribe. So your jaws of mork are squigs, your uh, glogs mega mobs are going to be trogs, and then your grim scuttle tribes are for your spiders. There is no additional rules for your uh, Moon Clan Grots. So if you are a Moon Clan Grot player like I currently am, um, there are no benefits there. But um, when you look at the sub allegiance, they're all going to get an ability, a command ability, a command trait, an artifact, and one to three battalions depending on where where you are a couple of key collets that i would make i'm not going to go through every single thing we'll come we'll, we'll be here till the cows come home but the jaws of mork you squig you squig army one of the things that i've really enjoyed and i've actually played this is that the running riot ability allows you to re-roll the movement characteristic for your friendly squigs this is massive majority of squigs other than i think it's a squig herd uh, is a randomized movement. So if you don't like your movement characteristic, you can re-roll it. And it's cool because it even benefits things like the Colossal Squig that has like a 4d6 move, which is really sweet. On top of all of that, um, the rule called Get Some Loon Shrine Downham, um, it allows your uh, your Mangler Squig to fight on the top of its damage profile. So um, the Mangler Squig degrades pretty quickly, and you know the last thing you want to do is be in combat in uh, is it five to seven? I think that's the it's like a roller coaster, right? It starts off really good in the middle of the damage profile, it's hot garbage, and then as it's about to die, it gets good again. So using a command ability to be able to um, to fight at the top bracket is really powerful for a Mangler Squig. You want it to fight as, as healed up as possible. So that's awesome. Um, and I'm not a big fan of the artifact. Uh, the battalions have some good use as well. 
the mega mob, the Trogoth build. Um, two callouts I would make there is that the monstrous regeneration ability gives you a plus one to the dice roll for your Trogoth regeneration. So when you look at the war scroll of a Trogoth, uh, your Dank Hold, your Fell Water, and your Rock Guts, they normally heal on a four. So getting plus one to that heal will mean that they're healing um, on a three plus. Uh, I think they heal D3 wounds. They don't come back. They don't. Re they don't come back from the dead like uh, your your death, like your night haunt. But you will keep them healed up. And a lot of them have like a natural minus one uh, to hit anyway. So they're a pretty durable unit to begin with. And then when you're under the light of the bad moon, um, which is the one of the allegiance abilities, um, it actually allows you to either re-roll that attempt or. If your first attempt was successful, it allows you to double the amount of wounds healed. So um, that's really sweet. That's really sweet. Uh, on top of that, you have um, the oblivious to sorcery rule, which I think is really fun and I know is quite popular, which is a command ability that allows your fell water and your rock guts to ignore spells and endless spells on a 4+. When they're wholly within 12 inches of the Dankhold hero. So you, you don't have a lot of hero choices with Trog builds. So you're probably going to be around your, your Dankhold anyway. Um, and there's, they, they don't have a lot of bodies. So you're probably going to be hugging your heroes. So being able to ignore the specs, effects of spells and endless spells on a four plus um, is really good. And um, Gits players in general often have a lot of CP. So another really good one that I liked. And then your spider build. So two callouts that I would make with the spider build is one is the prophet of the spider god command trait that gives you a once per battle ability of treating the the friendly grim scuttled spiders um uh, as as if they're under the light of the bad moon so um so the, the the light of the bad moon isn't happening all the time it's a bit of a uh, it's a it's a weird effect if you're new to if you're new to gits you know you, it's a bit of fun right but what it what it ultimately means, right, is that when spiders when spiders aren't under the light of the bad moon, when they're not, they do mortal wounds. When they I think it's a hit roll, if they roll a six to hit, it's a mortal wound. Instead, when when they're under the light of the bad moon, it means you're doing mortal wounds on a five plus. So not only are you reducing it by one, but because you've now added the plus that wasn't there it means you can bring that down. So if there's any other ways you can find a plus one to hit, you can start bringing them down to fours and threes and twos. So it's very hard to get it down to that type of level, but know that either way, uh, being able to bring that down is is great. Um, and then when you look at the Grim Scuttle, speaking of that, actually, the Grim Scuttle Spider Cluster, which is one of the battalions, um, it allows you to get plus one to the hit rolls for melee units in the battalion, and the battalion is focused on your um, on your spider riders. So what it's going to do is it means that when you are, when you are under the light of the bad moon, you're doing mortal wounds on four plus instead of sixes to hit. So again, you're doing a whole bunch of mortals, which is which is nice. Um, if you are interested in seeing more about these particular builds, um, as I mentioned, they are they are all old white dwarf rules. I actually haven't seen any updates, and if there is an update, um, maybe in, uh, something that's updated since, please let me know. But um, I have a video on all three of these: Jaws of More, uh, Jaws of More, uh, the Mega Mob, and the Grim Scuttle Tide so, Tribe. So um, you can see some of this list in action, talking to an expert. Speaking of experts, let's talk about the, the the lady of durability, the lady of life herself, Alariel the Ever Queen. And where do I start with Alariel? Alariel, I think when we start seeing Alariel was getting a War Scroll update, I think when I saw Marathi get changed, Marathi got a huge boost in Broken Realms Marathi, a massive boost. Um, and then we, we, we got a new battle tome afterwards as well, which was sweet. And, you know, I think when people heard that Alaria was getting a new War Scroll, Sylvaneth players were licking their lips to work out um, what was going to change with Alaria. She She's such a great model and she's a very expensive for her points and very rarely did she hit the table. It's really hard to build a list within Alaria. So what has changed? First off, there's a big change and that is her points have changed from 600 to 740. And I'm sure you're thinking, Anthony, 
she wasn't hitting on the table at 600. How on earth is she going to hit at 740? And that's a really good question. One of the reasons that I think her prices, her points have gone up, right, is first off, she gets to summon units. We know that. She can bring off a unit of Kurnoth Hunters. She can summon a whole bunch of things, which gives her a bit of durability. You can almost build those points into her points. So those points of the unit she can summon into her um, into her points, which is why she's so expensive. Cool. Put that to the side. She's still a bit pricey. One of the things that happened in the new update with Alariel is that she became insanely durable, like crazy and durable. And one of the reasons she's become, uh, you know, very, very tough to take down is there is a tweak that's on the screen, which is the life boom. There's been a big change to life bloom. And the old life bloom just used to heal a bunch of Sylvaneth units. So she would she would um, she would get D three wounds to heal on units that were wholly within thirty, which is great. It's going to heal up a bunch of Kurnoth hunters. It'll heal up some of your, your heroes like Drychar. Awesome. But the big change has happened is that she also now heals herself, and she is going to heal herself two D six wounds. So if you look at that war scroll, uh, it is. We, obviously, you could still roll two, right? And then she's not going to be that durable. But, you know, there's a, a lot better chance of keeping her on the table in addition to some of the other things that are coming in, which is going to be, one, the living battering ram has become more consistent. So um, you will do D3 mortal wounds on a two plus. And, um, and if you, yeah, if, like, it used to only be like D3 mortals. So when you, I think it was when you made a charge, you would you would roll a dice and um, you would do a whole bunch of damage. So it's not bad. I mean, Alariel is not the best combat monster. You probably, um, you're not replacing Durthu with Alariel. She's a good utility piece. She can hold her own, but not necessarily going to be the Marathi in your builds. Her core stat profile, um, like the move, the save, the bravery, and her wounds kind of stayed the same. The Spear of Kurnoth, the, um, it, it used to be, I think it was a asterisk, so it kind of degraded with the profile. That's now a flat 24 range. Uh, and also it's got a flat 6 damage. So um, it does degrade, but I think it used to be like D6. So um, you are getting more consistency from Alariel. Her Great Antlers now have a 2-inch range. I think it was a 1-inch range. And the the hit and the wound profile as well has slightly improved. She gained a rule called Swirling uh, Glow Spite that allows her to retreat and shoot, or retreat and charge, or both. You can do you can do the retreat and shoot and or charge, which is going to be getting her out of combats, getting away from certain things, or um, you know, it's obviously hard to maneuver. She's got a massive base, but being able to to better position Alariel, and I, I get the feeling that they're trying to get her more into combat, where previously she would kind of be sitting in the back waiting to pick her battles. There is a uh, once per game summon, which we've already spoken about. There's been minor changes to the talons of dwindling, which, um, yeah, and. And it looks like the command ability has, has, has stayed the same as well. So I think is it the, um, and me, I think metamorphosis, the spell that's on her has, um, is, is the same, I think, or there might be a minor change. So majority of the stuff really came around the survivability and the durability, as you can see on the screen, the, or the various wall scroll changes, nothing massive. Um, and, for me, this was hard to judge the War Scroll because we are on the eve of AOS 3. That's, that's for me, it's really hard. You know, she went up in points, which is you're like, oh, far out. I'm not going to take her ever. But if the, if the whole game changes in its points and basically, you know, she's basically like for like just in the new kind of structure um, and she's now become more durable, especially with the healing, um, does this incentivize? And we again, I mentioned we've we've seen new monster and new hero reactions. So, does this become more viable in your builds? Seven forty. I talked about it with Kragnos. It is quite high, and you really want to build around it. Um, will will this see her on the table? I think it's worth trying. Um, I don't know on the top tables at a grand tournament that she will be coming out. I don't think she's Marathi level. And you probably could argue that Marathi could go off in points and maybe she will. Uh, we don't know yet, 
We don't know what AOS 3 is going to look like, but um, I, I, would, I wouldn't write her off just yet. Um, right now, AOS 2, I would probably not take her. Um, I still probably wouldn't take her. I'd rather take um, the new unit, and I might as well talk about that now, and that is the War, the War Song Revenant. Um, and there's the, this is the new Sylvaneth unit that's come in at 275 points. And what do you get for your 275 points? You're going to get yourself a seven-wound leader. Um, it's not unique, and it's not named, which is great. So, you know, and I think about this, like, right, what is this going to do? And what's the benefits? And I'm actually surprised. This what, Not only is this a really nice model, but um, it's like half the size of the Eidolon. It's actually quite a large model. I was surprised how big the model actually was. And for my 275 points, I'm going to get myself a double caster. So it casts two spells, but it only can unbind one spell. So that that two doesn't go into the unbinds. Um, when the Warsaw Revenant is within nine inches of an awakened Wildwood, um, you're going to get plus one to the cast, which is going to be really nice. Uh, and that'll become more important as we get into the next part of this. But um, in the meantime, the Warsong Revenant also knows um, a signature spell, which is a uh, Unleash Swarm of Spites, which basically casts on a seven, and we know that we get plus one to the cast if we're near an Awakened Wildwood. But what happens, and this is a really interesting one, is that when you roll a dice that's equal to the casting roll, and let's hypothetically say that we just rolled the seven. We, we just got the spell off. We hit the seven. Um, what happens is... Um, the the number of the, the casting value becomes the amount of dice that I'm going to roll. So in this case, I rolled the seven to cast the spell. So I'm going to get seven dice and I'm going to roll those and uh, I'm going to roll them for each enemy unit that's within nine inches. And I think it's on a five plus, it does a mortal wound. So, you know, I'm probably going to, on, on seven dice, I'm probably going to average three wounds, which is not too bad. But that's to every unit within nine inches. So this is not going to be a wizard that's at the backfield um, throwing spells from 30 inches away. This is a wizard that is going to be in the middle of the table, in the thick of things. Um, obviously not going to be Durthu, but it's going to be in the action somewhere. It is under 10 wounds, so that's important. Uh, and it's important because the Awakened Wildwoods also got an updated War Scroll. So your terrain piece has changed slightly, and I'll I'll talk about that in a minute. The um, War Scroll, War Song Revenant also gained a 4 plus damage prevention roll. So yes, it's on 7 wounds, but um, you'll be able to protect yourself quite well in with wounds and mortal wounds. And because it's under 10 wounds, you're also going to be able to um, use Lookout Sir. So should you have the um, the Warsong Revenant near, let's say, Dryads or Spite Revs, um, you're going to get minus one to, to the shooting attacks should someone try to shoot you. You also get to have a Bravery buff. So you get plus one to the Bravery to Sylvaneth units within 12 inches, which is okay. I mean, Dryads or Tree Revs or Spite Revs, Kernoff Hunters, maybe. But again, we talked about this, I think it was in Kragnos, is that we don't know what's coming in AOS 3. There could be changes to Inspiring Presence, so I'll reserve my judgment on that ability. But I've noticed that Lumineth, Kragnos, this, this Warsong Revenant all have bravery benefits, so something must be coming. Something must come. The model also has the access to the Lore of the Deepwood, which is the Sylvaneth spells, and that's actually written on the War Scroll. And why that's really cool for me is because it means that I can take this model into a Living Cities army or bring it in as an ally and bring in the Lore of the Deepwood with it. Uh, normally, I wouldn't be able to access the Lore of the Deepwood, but this appears to be able to allow me to take it with me as an ally, and it is certainly in ally point figures. If I'm a Sylvaneth player, where do I stand on this particular one? It's an awesome model, really cool model. I think it's definitely worth considering. It's not as cheap as a Branch Wraith or a Branch Witch. Um, it is certainly more durable, and it certainly could be in the thick of things, supporting your Arch Revenant, your your Kurnoth Hunters, your Durthus, your Tree Lord Ancients. Um, it's not going to replace your Durthu. It's certainly not built as a, a combat monster. But again, we talk about those AOS 3 benefits. And I mentioned the, the 10 wounds or less, and this is where it becomes important. And that is Awakened Wildwoods has changed. And overall, I think it's a boost. One of the, the areas where it's become really um, 
really changed or really impactful in the change is that the line of sight blocking rules have changed in a number of ways. Previously, it was super annoying. You could put a branch wraith or a branch witch or a, um, even like a, a tree lord ancient in the middle of a wild woods, especially when it teleports, and you wouldn't be able to see out. So it means that Kurnoth hunters uh, who are sitting in the woods, even though they are, they are built and they live and they are from the groves, they could not see out of these trees. We always grinded my gears. But now what happens here is that if you have 10 wounds or more, you don't gain the benefits of line of sight blocking. So I think I think the Tree Lord Ancient, for example, or you know anything that has more than ten wounds, is um, is going not going to have line of sight blocking from this. So okay, not too bad. Remember that our War Song Revenant is seven wounds, and if I'm reading this correctly, it means that if I've got my Tree Lord Ancient who's got more than ten wounds sitting in the uh, the Wild Woods, it means you could see me. But the Branch Witch or the Branch Wraith you're not going to be able to see me. But there's also another update, and that is if you have the Sylvaneth keyword and if you're under those those 10 wounds, you can see out, um, which, is, which is super interesting because then it does mean that you could hide, as I mentioned, the Branch Wraith or the Branch Witch or the Arch Revenant, for example. I think the Arch Revenant's command ability requires line of sight. Um, it, it means that the, the rule is, is that the, they can see out but you still can't see in. So I couldn't choose the Branch Wraith sitting within the Wake and Wild Woods as a target, but you could shoot out, which is which is cool. It's a very interesting mechanic. I think it works well um, for a Sylvaneth player. There's a few other modifications. One is that um, you, you you used to do damage. So when, I think it was when a was it when a wizard was within six, I think it was. They were, you used to be able to do some damage if there was a successful cast of a spell near a wildwood. I think it was the, was it the um, aroused or aroused by magic? Um, that's been replaced by vengeful uh, forest spirits. And what happens is um, you'll do mortal wounds to an enemy within one inch of a wildwood on a six. If there is a wizard or an endless spell within six inches of the wildwood, that goes down to a four. So again, if you've got that branch witch, that branch wraith, that uh, who's both wizards, by the way, the Warsong Revenant, again, a wizard. Um, and if they're sitting in the middle of this awakened wildwood, one, you can't see them because it's blocking line of sight, but they can see you. If you get charged, they're going to do mortal wounds on a four uh, because they're a wizard. And hopefully you got yourself a nice little sexy unit of uh, spite revs or maybe Kurnoth hunters with swords who could be in there with them protecting the wizard. So uh, I mentioned earlier the, the Warsong Revenant would be good in the middle of the table, maybe going for objectives. Um, this kind of complements it maybe as the, the, the Wildwood that you summon on the table. Overall, it's a nice little boost, I think. And maybe you want to get yourself a, you know, a Spite, sp spite, spite Swarm Hive, um, which is one you know a very useful endless spell, being near a Wildwood, supporting your Kurnoth Hunters, lots of different list tech you could be thinking about. You've also got yourself the Sylvaneth Battalion. So they've walked away with one battalion, and that's Drycher's Sprite Grove. Uh, comes in at 120 points, and it requires you to take Drycher and two units of Spite Revs. So you're challenging yourself against Outcast. And the, the main benefit, obviously, other than the command ability and the lower drops, is that you get to put Rend on the, the Spite Revs. So if you are looking, and there's not a lot of rend in Sylvaneth, um, which is, again, why there's so much pressure on people like Drycher and your Kurnoth Hunters to do damage because there's not a lot of rend outside of that. But it is a alternate build to Outcast, and Outcast is super cheap. It's, it's one of the reasons why people take Outcast. It's probably the cheapest battalion to get your battle line, to get your units and get the lower drops. But if you don't want to take three units of, um, of of spite revs, if you were looking at taking dry char, I think this is a decent battalion because you're getting rend. Um, if you weren't going to take spite revs and you were building around, let's say, tree revs or or, or dryads, um, or you weren't planning on taking dry char, it's a bit of a tax for you in your build, um, then this is not for you. But I think this has some legs um, for those people who want to use spite revs. And spite revs are cheap at the moment.
Speaking of cheap or maybe not so cheap, we've got two new heroes. And I say cheap because um, they are cheaper than a Keeper of Secrets. And you've gained yourself two new heroes. You've got um, Dexessa, I think it's called. I'm sure you're going to let me know if I haven't got that correctly. And Senessa. So, De so I'm going to call it Dex and Senes. And they're both gorgeous models. They're just awesome models, um, so much so that as I was preparing this kind of video, I was actually really tempted to buy a, sl a Slanesh army. They are sexy as hell. And when we're talking about the Dexessa, which is the Talon of Slanesh, this is the more of the uh, the expensive build, um, so only slightly, but she's coming in, uh, they, are, they, sorry, they are coming in at 280 points. And it is more of the combat orientated. It's a mini keeper. Like they're they they're not keeper level, but they're not not keeper. Like they they they're kind of in this middle keeper light, but they have more utility and versatility in the build. And I'll I'll talk about both of them and what they're going to bring to the table in comparison to a keeper of secrets. So um, this is certainly the more expensive, but it's a bit cheaper than the the keeper, as I've mentioned. Um, they are bringing different strengths to the army. Um, one of the one of the big strengths that both of these models bring is that the profile doesn't degrade like a Keeper of Secrets. The Keeper really does degrade, while uh, Dexessa and um, Senessa, uh, they don't. They've got a pretty flat profile. But because they've got, they don't have a degrading profile, you also don't get the high swing. So, you know, the Keeper of Secrets has the um, the Impaling Claws. That does damage five. You don't have that big swing of damage five in these as well. Some things you're going to get from both of them. So they will always be minus one to hit in both combat and shooting, um, which which if you want that in your Keeper of Secrets, I think you need to take the whip. And I think it has to be within six. While regardless, um, this is going to be minus one to hit in both combat and shooting. And there is a lot of shooting in the meta right now. So uh, it could have, uh, uh, it could be quite good. They both can run and charge, which is going to be really powerful to get you into combat early. Again, really nice. And you're still going to get your ability, your allegiance ability as well, like, you know, your, like your locusts and stuff. In addition to all of that, they both can fly. So you are going to be able to retreat and charge, you go, and you, or, or you can run and charge. So you can run and charge or retreat, um, and you're going to be able to fly as well. So you're going to be able to get into combat early, you're going to have to do damage early, and then you can be able to jump over screens or reposition or get out of combat you don't want to be in. The other incentive that I, I really found with Dexessa is that, um, you know, there's a rule that's called, it's on screen here called the Joyous Battle Fury. And what it happens is that after this model has fought for the first time, so let's say, let's say we get into combat for round one. In every battle round after that one, so round two, round three, round four, sh they would gain one extra attack for both of the weapon profiles. So if I can keep this model alive um, over the full five rounds, it means I've gained plus four attacks on what is already a generous profile. On Dexessa as well, you've also got the Scepter of Slanesh. That is uh, a nice little have... It's a Battleshock immunity to, to demons, which we, we've ta already talked about how many benefits to bravery in some description we're seeing in these rules. So again, I'm really curious to see what's coming down the table, but it's the second part of the, um, of the Scepter that I really like. And that is that it allow allows once per turn for a, um, a friendly Slanesh demon to use their command ability for free. So um, it has no range as well from what I can see. So it means that, you know, even if Dexessa is, a, is on one side of the board and a Keeper of Secrets or some other type of demon hero is, is uh, on the other side of the board, it means that they could use their command ability for free. And I'm sure if you quantify that with, you know, the, the cost value of, uh, of a CP, um, it probably starts paying itself back. And, you know, if I was only running one Keeper of Secrets, would I swap this out for Dexessa? Probably not. But I know a lot of de uh, demon-focused Slanesh players are running two Keepers. And I think there might be some viability in building a second Keeper, but but making it Dexessa or making it Senessa. And 
this is not the combat monster that Dexessa is. So the, the Senessa is the, the voice of Slanesh, and they are a little bit cheaper than Dexessa. So um, Senessa is two sixty. Uh, Dexessa is uh, sorry. Senessa is two sixty. Dexessa is two eighty, and Senessa is more of a more of a wizard and more of a support hero than Dexessa, which is more of a combat hero. Geez, I'm struggling with these names. Um, Dexessa has 10 wounds. Senessa has nine wounds. They both have, I believe, movement 12, and they both have a four-up armor save. So they're pretty decent. That's that's pretty pretty generous. And much like De Dexessa, Senessa has a minus one to hit in both combat and shooting, which is great. Senessa has a shooting attack profile that um, you don't have to roll a hit or a wound, but what you do is you pick one enemy unit that is um, within uh, the range. So I think the range was 18 and obviously has to be visible to them. And what happens is the, the opponent, opponent hero rolls a dice. So actually you get your opponent to roll a dice. And if the roll is less than the unit's armor save that you've selected, and it's not a six, the unit is going to suffer D6 mortal wounds. So if I've got a, so so let's repeat the rule. If you roll less than the, the unit's armor save, so obviously the, the you're probably going to be picking a hero and they're probably going to have a three up, a four up, a two up if you're lucky. If you get under, awesome, you're going to do some mortal wounds. If it is equal or greater, and it's not a six, it's D3 mortal wounds. And if you just roll a six, nothing happens. So obviously the lower you can get, the better chance you're going to get that D6 mortal wounds from something that doesn't require you to hit or wound. The other part to this, which I thought was really interesting, was that the voice of Slanesh has a command ability that allows you to have to, it allows you to, the, the spell there, right? The the whisper of doubt. It has a casting value of six, and you basically do some shenanigans within with a an enemy hero within three inches. And you're like, oh man, it means I've got to have this wizard wizard support type greater demon in combat, and it's probably not what I want to do. But when you look at the voice of Slanesh ability, it actually allows you to cast that spell outside of three. It actually becomes board wide, so. The, the, the Whisper of, of Doubt is a casting value of six. If casted, you pick one enemy unit and with the Voice of Slanesh um, ability, now it's table wide and you roll 3d6. And if the roll is equal or greater than the hero's bravery characteristic, you get to add plus one to the attack rolls um, for that hero. So uh, it does obviously benefit you if you are going to be within three, but uh, not necessarily do you have to be. It's it's helpful, but the other part as well is um, the Parvain of Slanesh, which is a no it's a spell. Is it a spell? I think it's a spell that's sitting in the um, the the Hedonites of Slanesh Battle Tome um, uh, that allows you to do mortal wounds on a five plus. Um, you basically roll some dice, and if it's uh, if it's equal, so you roll you roll. A, amount of dice equal to the model's bravery char movement characteristic movement um so you so the higher the movement the more dice on a five plus it does mortal wounds and the the command ability sorry the 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 voice of slanesh um will allow you to do that spell board wide as well so again a lot of utility between the two would i drop my first keeper of secrets for either dexessa or senessa probably not unless i run out of points um, but these would be definitely a good alternative for um, a second Keeper of Secrets. Or if I found the points, I could probably actually run both of them. I think both of them combined is what, 500-ish points? So Keeper of Secrets plus that, that's you're getting three three pretty solid heroes for under 1,000 points. You got yourself also a battalion. And it's an interesting one. It turns the contorted epitome into a unique named hero. Uh, it comes in at 130 points and it also requires you to take a unit of fiends and a unit of seekers. Um, what do you get for your battalion? You do get one and only rule, and that is the Mirror of Twisted Truths. 
And what that essentially is, it's a shooting attack. It allows you to do mortal wounds based on um, the, the amount of models in the unit. So if you have, so yeah, it's, it, it's, it's nice to chip away against, um, against units, but it's not that great. So basically what happens is, um, where is it? So you roll a dice for each model in the unit. If that unit has a, a wound character, characteristic of one, so your horde armies, for each six, you are going to do a mortal wound. If the unit has more than one wound, so they're two wounds, three wounds, four wounds, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you roll those dice, uh, and then for each six, it would do D3 mortal wounds. So it could be nice to start clearing out or, or getting rid of some of those eels, um, especially those defensive pesky eels that you can't choose normally as a shooting target, and they ignore rend. So a nice way to get rid of some things like that. Your your fiends and your secret unit choices are an interesting one because. You know, looking at some of the ways that new Sl Slanish players are building around the their their new Heated Knights rules, fiends are starting to come back. There is a bit of a bit of a movement. Some people are liking the the minus one to cast for enemy wizards within twelve inches and the minus one to hit in melee. So that can be quite nice. And you know, when you combine that with Glutos, for example, they can start becoming minus two, um, which is pretty pretty nice. Alternatively, your Seekers have a ability that allows them to run 2d6 and it allows them to run and charge in the same turn or the same round. So, um, you know, this is not a tax. Um, if, you, if you're willing to open up and, and explore some of the options, there is some things in this. Um, but when you start then adding all the points up, this is your keeper points. These are your Glutos points. These are your Sigvold points. However you're building your list around, it's obviously taking up your points. But if these are things that you were already thinking about or maybe you're already taking two of the three, it's definitely worth considering because that shooting attack um, is, is, is decent. But because it is a named unique character, it does mean that you wouldn't be able to put on an artifact on your contorted epitome if that's something you're already doing. Next up, we've got our Cities of Sigma, and they have gained themselves an extra city, and that city is the City of Excelsius. Uh, oh, I almost went that nerdy, Excelsior, but no, it's the City of Excelsius, which is based in the realm of Gur. And if you know the realm of Gur, uh, obviously one is going to be the narrative for Age of Sigma 3, so we'll learn more about what Gur means for us. But at a bare minimum, it means that if you take a realm artifact, you are locked into the Predator's talk, uh, which is an okay artifact. It's not the best. Like I would probably just choose artifacts from this particular free city. But Excelsior follows the theme of Settler's Gain. If you looked at Broken Realms Techless, you would see that um, the city allows you to take the rules from your Cities of Sigma Battalion, so your uh, Ways of the Free Peoples, which allows you to have like your Amplified Sorceries, which basically means that your Endless Spells are better. And it would say like Empowered by the Realms. Um, you do get you things like your Adjutant, your, your Wise Counsel. So um, if your General has six wounds or less, you can pick... Um, a friendly hero to be his homie and uh, that wise council homie will give him a command ability. If he is within three inches of the general, uh, every hero phase on a four plus, you get that extra CP, which is nice. Um, and you can also take a, a an honored retinue, which is a basically a, a, a bunch of bodyguards where you can bounce mortal wounds off. So long as that unit has 20, 20 wounds or less or 20 uh, models or less. Uh, you can also obviously bring Stormcast in with the Stormcut Keep. So if you choose Excelsius, it means you get to keep those, which is great. Um, in addition, you are one, obviously coming from Gur, put that to a side, but you get two other things. So you're going to get yourself the pro Gift of Prophecy, you get yourself the Command Ability, and you also get three Command Traits, three Artifacts, and three Spells to choose from. So you're going to have some, some, some juicy things to pick from. When you look at the the command traits, you're going to get uh, uh, we got one of three options, right? You get this retreat and charge for your general, um, and I think if that if it if it does charge after retreat, it becomes minus one to hit. So pretty nice for like your your dreadlord on black dragon or your free guild general on griffin or something. Um, 
The other, the other two, one is a, an ability to redeploy D3 units at the start of the first battle round, which I thought was interesting, a very uh, old Barrack Zilfen type thing almost, where you can uh, realize that you have, you know, not you've been baited or you know you need to put some support somewhere else you could redeploy some of the units i thought that was an interesting mechanic uh and then the other one is you can stop an enemy hero from using their command ability if they're within three inches of your general so you'd need a super durable super fast um you'd need some type of again dreadlord on black dragon free kill general on griffin style hero to that could get into three and deny your your um enemy hero using command ability which could be really good actually it could be really good but you'd have to build a really defensive um general in my opinion you've also got uh, actually speaking of defense you've got three artifacts to choose from and I'll be honest, I I did a massive dance. I, I, I basically did like the electric boogaloo when I saw the artifacts on offer because one of them was the Griff Feather Charm. That's correct, folks. The formerly malign sorcery Griff Feather Charm that gives your, your bearer minus one to hit and plus one movement is back, baby. Uh, forget the other two. We have Griff Feather Charm and it's back. You also got three spells to choose from. Uh, my favorite would be a spell called Cower, which um, casts on a six. And what you do is you pick an enemy monster that's within 12 inches of the caster. And you roll 2d6. And if it's higher than the monster's bravery, it can't charge in their next turn. Ouch. So, uh, I mean, obviously monsters often have a very high bravery. Uh, you'd you'd want to think about how you can debuff those bravery, whether it's with an endless spell or a spell or some type of ability. But, you know, being able to stop a monster from charging could be really nasty. Although I think my Mega Gargans are like bravery seven. So stopping a Mega Gargan from charging, I would cry. Your command ability allows you to bounce some mortal wounds um, from the unit if they roll a six to save. So when you when you roll up your saves, if you roll a six, you'll do I think it's one mortal wound for every six you roll. Okay, it's all right, not too bad. Um, and then there's also this gift of of prophecy, which I think is a really interesting risk versus reward kind of mechanic, where um, once per phase. When you have a friendly unit to shoot or fight, you can say that the attack is going to be prophesized. So uh, it's going to happen every time, well, sorry, every phase. So in the shooting phase and the combat phase, uh, I believe in both turns, because it just says once per phase, right? It doesn't say friendly phase. It doesn't say your phase. It's just phase. So you've got a phase, and let's say it's a shooting phase. I can choose to use the gift of prophecy. If I do so, I roll a dice. If I roll a one, my shooting unit that I'm rolling for is going to be minus one to hit themselves. So um, if I normally hit on fours, I'm now hitting on fives. If I'm hitting on twos, I'm now hitting on threes. Um, it's not a debuff. It's not a debuff for opponents hitting me. It's me being sucky. I suck more. Um, but if I roll a two plus, um, anything higher than a one, it means that I gain a plus one to hit. So if I roll a one, I'm minus one to hit. If I'm uh, two to six, I'm plus one to hit. So if you're someone who often relies on, let's say, the Celestial Hurricanum for plus one to hit, um, and you're willing to, to gamble and, and roll the dice and go for a two plus, you could save yourself 300 points on um on not taking the hurricanum um just purely off the back of getting the plus one to hit from the gift of prophecy the other the other set of rules coming in for cities of sigma and is not tied specifically into excelsius is these new models the the vendensed the uh dora i'm gonna i'm gonna butcher this one uh i'm just gonna call it dora dora the explorer we got dora the explorer with her crossbow and we have gallon um they both come in at 115 points so you you, you can buy them individually um you don't have to take both of them um if you do take one of them or both of them um for 115 points each they are a unique hero so there's no ability to customize them they are what they are they both have five wounds they have a four up armor save they have a movement of either four five or six depending on which one i think it's um crossbow has a five sword man no gallon has a six um they both have a shooting and they have a melee attack um Dor i think it's dorlina dorlina um she is more of the range threat. No surprise. You look at the crossbow, it has range, and it's range 24 crossbow. 
Gallon, on the other hand, is more of a, I would call him a utility because he has a decent short range shooting attack um, and he's decent in melee. So I would not say he's a melee specialist. I wouldn't say he's a specialist in any particular sense, but he will be a good supporting hero, just a utility. While um, you can see, is it Dorolina, uh, Dorina? Um, she's definitely more of a, a, a ranged threat. Both of the Vendensed have a 5-up damage prevention role, which is sweet. Uh, it means that they're going to be able to suck up some damage if people target them. If you're smart and you put them near a unit, they are, they're going to get Lookout Sir as well. If they target a Wizard or a Demon keyword unit, they will actually double the damage they do as well. So um, this probably incentivizes me to take the crossbow over. Gallon only has, like I think it's like a 9-inch or a 12-inch um, shooting pistol, but you know, like you, you're going to be close in combat. So for me, that crossbow is is starting to come look pretty sexy, especially when you start thinking about the current meta, right? In addition to all of that, in combat and in shooting, they can choose to target an endless spell. This is the first time I've ever seen this mechanic come in, so I'm really curious. I think this is this is sexy, right? I can target an endless spell. Now you're like, well, why would I do that? That's silly. Well, what happens, right? So let's say I've got my crossbow. Let's say I'm in combat. doesn't matter. It could be shooting. It could be in combat. Anytime I choose to attack with these units, I can target an endless spell instead. And what happens is I roll 2d6. If the roll is greater than the casting value, not the roll that the wizard casted on, but just on the war scroll, if it says it's a casting value of 6, if I roll a 7, that endless spell is gone. So Doralina's crossbow um, from 24 inches could be taking down Balwin Vortexes. It could be taking down the um, the Umbral Spell Portals. If your army is stuck with cogs or chronomatic cogs or shackles or there's a Geminids going around, you could shoot them off the board uh, or get into combat and do damage to them. If, you, if the Doralina's... Uh, Apologies if I'm saying this wrong, guys. I really, I really, truly do apologize. If the crossbow doesn't move, um, so if she doesn't move, um, she gets an additional attack. So it brings her up from two, up to two attacks, which is great. And Gallon um, can retreat and still shoot and or charge. So again, you're getting him around combat. He's doing a whole bunch of damage to di wizards and demons. Um, and you probably slingshot him into those in the backfield, especially you charge into a unit get out of there, retreat around the back, hopefully get into that juicy wizard. Both of them really do have a place. And my opinion, the, the crossbow is definitely where I would see the, the most use, uh, at least in the list that I'm building. And I, I thought about this and I go, right, well, I could put it in a living city list where um, I could set her up on the side of the battlefield um, because the setup is not a move, I'm going to get plus one to attack. Um, I could put her in Tempest Eye and have her in range of the Hawkeye command trait, which gives me plus one to wound. And if I'm next to a Hierocarnum, I get plus one to hit. So it means her shooting attack is hitting on twos, wounding on twos, double damage against wizards and demons, or shooting off endless spells. Um, even the the Excelsius prophecy rule, you know, getting the rolling that dice and a roll of a two plus, um, I get plus one to hit. She could be a really good candidate for that as well. So either way, interesting interesting models, and I think for 115 points, getting this durability of a five up damage prevention as well, I could see her in a lot of cities lists. Gallon, mm, I'm not. I, I could definitely see crossbow in the list. Um, Gallon, not so much. Oh, here we go. Lord Croak himself. Um, Seraphon did get a brand new model. They got Lord Croak. He has been replaced. RIP Finecast Lord Croak. We have a new model and a new War Scroll to go with it. The points value of Croak did go up. Formerly, Croak was 320, and I would say he was honestly abusively under-costed for the amount of sheer terror that Croak did uh, 300, 320 points was church change. It was just, just need to be way more. And Croak has gone up to 430 points. So what has Croak got for the new war scroll to justify the new points? And when I, when I looked over Croak, um, and by the way, I'm going to give a shout out to, um, 
to another YouTuber here. So Caleb Hastings, I'll put the link down below. Um, Caleb Hastings is a, uh, a Seraphon specialist, and he's already done a pretty awesome video on Lord Croak. So if you were, if you are a Croak fan and you want to know, um, you've probably already seen it, but know that Caleb Hastings, go check him out. Uh, absolute legend. He's even done videos with, with me as well. So Caleb's kind of broken that down. But when I looked at Lord Croak's old and new War Scrolls, I'll call out some changes that I noticed. And the, the War Scroll feels and smells like Lord Croak. It's not like this has been a big change to Lord Croak. There are some changes and some big ones, but it just generally feels like Lord Croak. His arcane vessel uh, where you draw line of sight from your skink wizard or your oracle remains uh, unchanged. The Azerite Force banner is mostly unchanged, but it did get a minor boost where if you have an enemy monster within the, the counting range, it's going to count as five models. So that's a little boost. You get your Celestial Deliverance and the Comet's Call, those two signature spells that um, everyone knows. They appear to be unchanged, so there's no changes there. Um, but there is a positive change that the Supreme Master of Order, where Croak used to get plus one to casting, dispelling, and unbinding, that's gone up to plus two. So now Croak is getting a plus two on his cast, dispelling, and unbinding. Awesome. The command ability, the uh, what's it called? The Gift from the Heavens. That has slightly changed, and it's now called Supreme Gift from the Heavens. So you, what it used to do is you used to be able to pick one model, and that would allow them to fly and get plus one to their armor save or save roll against missile weapons. That's now turned into D3. So the actual core of the spell hasn't changed. Or sorry, the command ability hasn't changed. It's just that it now affects D3 Seraphon models within 18 inches of Lord Croak. So that's pretty good. Um, I'm thinking about three flying Stegodons right now or three flying Bastilodons. Now let's go Steggies. Let's do three flying Steggies. You've got yourself, um, the big changes really are, are kind of tied together. So Lord Croak um, used to only have seven wounds, but to make him super durable, you used to have a four up armor save. So sorry, sorry, a four up damage prevention roll. So he'd get a four up after save um, on his wounds. Instead, Lord Croak has lost his um his four up damage prevention. So that's no longer there. But he is now on 18 wounds. So he's almost tripled his wounds. He has a lot more wounds. Um, and what that means though is that he is no longer eligible to sit on the Balwin Vortex because the Bowwin Vortex requires you to have eight wounds or less. So Croak is now ineligible to get up on that big whirling tornado. And so he's not on, he's not on the tornado. He is not uh, getting a damage prevention roll, but he's gained 18 wounds. There's one other thing that's made him very interesting. And if, if you played Age of Sigma in first edition, there was a very, Lord Croak had a very interesting rule, and it's almost like they've brought that kind of back. And the way it works... Um, is that at the end of every phase, not turn, phase, um, if any wounds or mortal wounds are allocated to Croak, you roll 3d6 and you add the number of wounds or mortal wounds. So you basically combine both. If you roll 20 plus, Croak's dead. On any other roll, Croak is fully healed. So if you do chip damage to him, you do two or three wounds, he rolls those 3d6 and it's under under 20, it means that Croak is fully healed and those wounds are no longer there. And that's in every phase. So what you're going to see is probably two different mechanics. One is that you're going to be doing chip damage to Croak. You're just going to shoot at him or, or do combat and do sm small amounts of damage in the hope that he unluckily rolls that 20 plus and Croak's gone. Alternatively, it means you're going to have to put in all of your damage in one particular phase and really try to super supersize that roll. Now, if you he's only got 18 wounds. So if you can do 18 wounds in a single phase, that dice roll doesn't happen. He's just straight up dead. But any other roll, obviously, the more damage you can do, the 14, the 15, the 16, even a 10, I think even a 10 on 3D6 is over 50%. Don't, don't maths hammer me, guys. But... Um, I think, you know, just if you, I, th I think, I think Caleb was talking about if you can put 10 wounds on him or nine wounds on him, it's like a 50, 50 chance that he's going to die in that phase. So again, if you want to learn more about croak and, and maybe some, some details that I missed, I would go check out Caleb. 
to me, Lord Croak, I think you're going to start seeing versatility. If you ask me what the, the Seraphon game plan was back in, you know, l- last week, I would tell you, you'd have Croak, you'd have the Bellwind, you'd have the Astralith Bearer, you'd have the, is it the Eternal Guard, you've got a Wall of Skinks. You know, I could tell you literally the whole strategy and what you're going to do, and it was either could I handle it or not. I think you're going to see versatility. You're going to see Croak now moving around the board. He can't be on the Bailwind. He's not going to be static. Um, you're not going to see him just protected by Skinks. You're going to see him flying around the table, m- moving around, doing things, almost like what Arcan the Black does on the table. Um, he's not going to be in combat. He's still going to be protected. This might incentivize things like Carnosaurs to kind of be moving around with him. But either way, or might be supporting Skinks, I don't know. Uh, but either way, I, I like the change, and I think it wasn't too aggressive. It's not like he's 600 or 700 points. He's not not unusable. But you also may think about taking a generic Slan instead. But uh, either way, I think I, I'm actually probably going to buy this model. It's actually a really nice model. I'm glad they finally did the model justice. Skaven. Skaven got some new things. Skaven got, um, uh, there was a whole bunch of things, right? You know, your, your clan Mulder units got the, um, some, some new mutations. So your hideous abominations and which is your hell pit abominations and your rat ogres have gained some new mutations. I think it's the six going to the hell pits and three going to the ogres. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of rules around the way that you allocate the mutations based off clan, uh, Mulder. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't see a lot of clan Mulder hitting on the tables anyway. It's normally scryer or just your generic clan rats. Um, and we'll talk about clan rats in a minute, but one of the things that I really liked about the mutations is that rat ogres might see use on the table again. And one of the things I liked about the rat ogres was that the rat ogres will are, are fighting beasts. So they're going to get themselves a mutation. And one of them that I really liked was called toughen sinews, um, which gives them an extra two wounds. So that actually makes a rat ogre six wounds. And it also makes their armor save four plus. Normally they're five plus. So you're gaining yourself two extra wounds and plus one armor save for these super tanky durable rat ogres and they might be a nice compliment or maybe even an alternative build to uh what's it called uh, storm fiends i think it's something i think it's something to work for but where you're going to really see the most change in skaven lists and i really like this because as a as a goblin player immediately when i read these rules i'm like these are like fanatics and skaven armies can now gain a hidden weapons team So that's going to be in addition to your Battle Tome trait. So you don't lose anything. You're only gaining here. And look, there's a lot of text here on the slide if you're looking at the slide. So I'll just give it to you in a nutshell. You can pick a hidden weapon. You can pick your hidden weapons teams with the exception of your warp grinders. And um, so you've got your rattling guns, your warp fire throwers, your doom flayers. I think they're the only three weapons teams that aren't the warp grinders. But anyway, you got your warp te- your, your weapons teams, and if you have a unit of clan rats or or storm vermin with ten or more models, which I think normally is what you're going to have anyway, your starting your starting size, you can essentially hide your weapons team in the clan rats or the storm vermin. So you don't deploy them on the table. You put them to the side. You probably get a little bit of piece of paper or some notebook and say which unit they're going to be hiding in, right? Your opponent has no idea where they are. And that's going to be really powerful because it means your your opponent can't shoot off your weapons team before they get into range. So how do I get them out? At the start of the shooting phase or at the end of the charge phase, so long as you didn't run, you can set them up. So if you set them up at the start of the shooting phase, it does mean that they're able to shoot so long as you didn't run. If you set them up at the end of the charge phase, um, you're obviously going to get them out of combat and things like that. And where I really like this, and probably you as Skaven players have already connected the dots here, but in case you haven't, um, where I like the idea of was setting them up at the start of the shooting phase, my clan rats, um, and I've got to be inside of three of my unit, but outside of three of you. So let's say that my clan rats, I'm going to set them up so that that I'm going to be three inches away from you, the enemy. The The warp fire throwers have a range of eight. And um, so, so they're not shooting, they're not, they're not Giselles, hell, they're not even Acolytes. 
you know, really, really f- low range. And if you pop them up in the front, it means that um, – because because their range attack is interesting, right? You do damage based on how many models are within the shooting range. So um, you would count up the amount of models that's within essentially the eight inches, which would be five inches outside of your three, and you'll do mortal wounds. And you can double down there if you use the more more uh, warp fire that's on the uh, the war scroll. And that would do two hits instead of one. So you could really burn an eight and you could probably double down. I think I think they're clan scryer as well. So you might be able to use one of the command traits. So there might be some more more things you could do if you had a clan scryer uh, general or a hero um, within range of your warp fire throwers. But either way, hidden weapons teams are sexy as all hell. And I can't wait to see Skaven players using that. Speaking of Skaven, you've also got yourself a battalion. Um, this is an interesting one, the battalion. You got yourself a Warlock Bombardier, uh, which is a named unique character, so you can't put a command trait, can't put an artifact on them. You've also got yourself a Warp Lightning Cannon and a unit of Storm Fiends. And I'm not sure about this one, you guys. Maybe you'll tell me otherwise, but I saw this and I thought myself maybe the Warp Lightning Cannon was a bit of a tax. I mean, unless you wanted it, right? because there is no benefit to having the Warp Lightning Cannon in this battalion. There's literally no benefit. Your Bombardier is going to get to re-roll its hit rolls for the Doom Rocket, which is good because the Doom Rocket hits on a four, um, and it does mean that the damage profile becomes a plus one. So it would be D6 plus one damage um, should you get it through. You obviously could use the Clan Scryer uh, Warpstone Spark to add more damage to it, but getting a bit more consistency from the Doom Rocket is nice, as well as that your um, your Warlock Bombardier is probably going to have to follow your Storm Fiends because your Storm Fiends will get plus one damage for the Shock Gauntlet. So they're your combat uh, weapon choice, not your shooting. It's your combat, your, your Shock Gauntlets. Um, and the Shock Gauntlets will do plus one damage if they're within 12 inches of your warlock bombardier in the battalion it's not too bad i don't, I don't mind that um uh, but the reason i said that the warp lightning cannon is attacks is because the abilities have no effect to it so um which if you were taking a warp lightning cannon great you've got one they're they're a bit inconsistent um they they, they do some good mortal wounds from afar um this probably it might be a bit hard to use the the last set of rules the warp lightning teams with the clan rats along with this because storm fiends especially if you're taking like blocks of is it was it six or nine i think they're units of three um they do take up a lot of points and then you're adding the battalion you're adding the, the bombardier you're adding the the lightning cannon then you're making trade-offs elsewhere but either way you got two good interesting builds beasts of chaos you have gained yourself a whole bunch of new allegiance abilities and um these are in addition to what is in your battle tome. So you don't sacrifice your battle tome rules here, but you're also going to get one for your gores, your war herds, and your thunder scorn. Your gore one is an interesting one because it allows you to reroll charge rolls for your friendly gore units, but it's not gore keyword. So it's not going to be your ungores or your ungore raiders. It is purely gore. So, um, so you still get to use your Brayherd Ambush, you still get to use your Creatures of the Storm, your Blood Gorge, your Grey Phrase, but with your Gore Battle Fury, it's going to allow you to re-roll the charge rolls in the same turn they come in from reserve. So I've played a lot of Beast of Chaos players. They set up a unit from, um, from, from reserve. It has to be outside of nine inches of an enemy. Uh, the likelihood of hitting that charge is like 25%. If you then lose the turn, you just get shot off the board. And it was just like, why did I even bother? So re-rolling the charge, maybe even add chronomatic cogs there. And um, you can almost guarantee a charge from anywhere around the board, um, which is really hard as an opponent to screen. So um, not too bad. I really like that one. The other one, and there's actually a battalion coming up soon, uh, is also going to benefit the war herd is that um, you're going to do some mortal wounds on the charge, whether it's going to be um, on a 4+. plus. Or if you are a Warherd hero, or if you've got more than three models, so if you're like a big block of uh, Bulgors, you'll do Mortal Wounds on the charge on a 2+. Plus. And then Thunderscorn. I'm not going to go through Thunderscorn. It's been like three or four years since I've seen Thunderscorn on the table. You can read the ability yourself, but there's a bunch of things. 
I mean, I like dragon ogres. They're cool. I haven't seen them in years. Your beast lord got changed, and there was a couple of changes. Actually, there's a number of changes on the beast lord. I think, yeah, it went up in five. It went up five points. Okay, whoop de do. May, may, that might be the five points though that gets you over your points limit, and that might be frustrating, or it might actually be the five points that gets you a triumph. I don't know. But what you will have happen to your beast lord is that you've lost your reroll ones to hit because it used to have a rule around dual axes. So you still got your dual axes to attack. It's just there's no ability to give you the reroll of the damage. You have gained a rule though that allows you to um, run and charge, which is um, very, very nice. You also gain, uh, yes, yeah, so you get your run in charge, and that's really powerful as well because you've only got like a, a six inch move, right? Your, your six inch move is not a lot, so you want to get into combat early. The, there's that hatred of heroes, which is um, you, you've always had it, but it's been modified. And where it's been modified is that you score two hits um, on a six, as opposed to, I think it was used to be able to re-roll two wound rolls. So there's a minor change there with that. And you used to have a command ability called Grizzly Trophy. It's still there. It's just no longer a command ability. So, um, so you don't have to spend a command point, which is helpful. What it does allow you to do, though, is... Well, what, what what you want to do with Grizzly Trophy is um, you want your Beast Lord to fight first. So you want to get into combat with multiple units. And what happens is if the Beast Lord can kill an enemy model in combat, your Bray Herd, uh, I think it's within range, uh, 18 inches, is going to get plus one to their wound roll, which is good. I mean, your Bray Herd is what? Your, your Gores, your Ungores, your Tuscor Chariots. Um, your Zangor have the Gore keyword, so that would help maybe your Skyfires or your Enlightened or even your Zangor on foot. If you slay an enemy hero or a monster in combat with your with your Beast Lord, you'll also get plus one to hit on those Gores, Ungores, Best of Gores, Ungore Raiders. I mean, they're not your Bull Gores. You, you, I mean, your Gores and your Ungores are your screens, your chip damage. So it's nice. It's, you know, it's not going to... You're not going to win the Masters with, you know, gores and ungores, but it could be enough to claim an objective, cause battle shock, finish off an enemy and get them to move forward. Yeah, I mean, you, you're not boosting your your, um, your your big bull boys. But what you did see in also another boost too, or maybe, maybe, maybe a boost, you've got your Jabba Slife, and your Jabba Slife has got a points increase of five points. So it's gone from 160 to 165. And you have got probably, it's probably a boost. I, th I think I think this has got a boost. I think the Jabba Slife used to be really good, had a War Scroll change and everybody dropped them then. Um, and now there might be some reason to bring them back because you now have a Armor Saber 4 Plus, which is used to be 5, so that's nice. You've got a modified attack roll from the tongue, which is um, plus two attack, but you have a flat damage. I think it was D3, now it's just a one. You've got yourself the improved st spiked tail. So it used to be rend one, it's now rend two, which is pretty good. And then the big change come from the aura of madness, which um, is causing a minus one to cast, minus one to dispelling, and a minus one to unbind rolls for enemy wizards within six inches of a Jabba Slife. Okay, not too bad. You probably want to go for those big wizards. You're not going to be able to get your wizards in the backfield, but probably your your hero wizards, you know, your vampire lord on zombie dragon, for example, might be a good target for this. But in addition to all of this, when an enemy is within three inches of the Jabba Slife, um, this is where the Aura of Madness kicks in, right? You get to roll 3d6 against the opponent's bravery, and um, if you are successful, if you roll higher than the enemy's bravery, it is is called the unit's deranged. But what that means is that the unit that is deranged gets plus one attack, which is a boost. You're actually buffing the the enemy to get plus one attack, which is which is pretty good. But the caveat is is that um, you if if you roll a one to hit, or they they roll one to hit, they'll do mortal wounds back to themselves. Now, what this might do is it might actually cause your opponent to f to spend a command point to reroll ones to hit because they don't want to roll those those unmodified ones. So you actually might get your opponent to spend a resource they didn't really want to spend. 
or at best they're going to take some damage back. So, um, and then if if you're taking if you're taking damage anyway from the plus one attack, um, you do have your bile blood that is going to cause mortal wounds back to your opponent on a four plus. So there's going to be a whole bunch of mortal wound damage happening and. You've also got the the minus one to cast dispelling and unbinding, so it's a unique it's a unique little piece. And with some of the monster rules that are coming, it might again be more useful. I think it's definitely worth considering as a debuff and as a just a monster that's running around the table doing its own thing. It probably doesn't need. It, could, it probably could go wizard hunting, uh, especially if we start seeing more mobile wizards. As I mentioned, vampire lord on zombie dragon could be a great example. We start seeing those types of wizards on the table running around the board who are also combat focused. Could be a good reason to bring in the Jabba Slythe. Beasts of Chaos also got themselves a battalion, and that was the Butcher's Herd. And it's forcing you to take a named gray, Great Bray Shaman, um, the bull, two units of Bull Gores, and one unit of Gorgon. Um, it's an interesting one. I keep saying interesting because. I, I don't know if it's good or not. And, and I could probably say that across the entire book because we just don't know what's happening with Age of Sigma 3. It, I think I'd be much more confident to tell you what's good and what's not good if this was in Age of Sigma 2 and we knew that there was no addition coming for, for a year, right? We still had to say, you know, who knows what the scenario is going to look like. Um, all I can do here in this video is just present ideas and get you to think about what might be coming so that you're ready and prepared. But with the with the the butcher's herd for 140 points, I really like this battalion. And the reason I like this battalion is you're getting more consistency. When you take the the battalion, the um the infused of chaos energy for your bull gores, you're going to get plus one to hit. So um being that your war herds, right? Your your war herd in the battalion is your Gorgon and your Bull Gores they're going to get plus one to hit. So that really brings down your bull gore attacks to be hitting on threes where they normally hit on fours. And that'll combine nicely with the doom bull that you're already bringing and you want their command ability that's going to give them plus one to wound. So your bull gore is going to really do some big damage. The Gorgon has always been inconsistent and being as a Gargan player, I know how swingy these models can be. But getting plus one to hit on the Gorgon as well really does increase the utility value because, you know, your butcher blades are hitting on twos. Um, it has five attacks at the top of the profile. It does three damage a piece. Um, if you roll six to wound, it does D3 mortals in addition. So people, when they see your units of, of bull gore and your gorgon, they're probably going to ignore the gorgon. Yeah, most people will ignore, like they, they don't do it. Like they don't normally do a lot. But wrapped up in this battalion, I think there's going to be more use. And I think with the consistency and not needing a command ability to get that consistency really does um, give it a nice little boost. The um, the the Great Bray, Bray Shaman staff, I, 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 got, I got caught out when I looked at that. I went, oh, the staff is a shooting attack normally. No, it's actually a melee attack. Um, I don't want my Great Bray Shaman in combat. I want it, I want, want it nothing near combat so um the staff getting plus two attacks is going to be nice if i'm trying to defend an objective and it's like a last resort um but i'm not running that bray shaman up the board with my with my posse um but i am gonna have to but I'm, but if i'm gonna tap into that plus one to hit from the infused with chaos energy it does mean that my great bray shaman has to be within 12 inches of the war herd so it does mean that I'm going to probably going to need maybe a second great brace shaman at the back um, with my with my terrain piece to to you know stabby stabby and sacrifice and you know take advantage of the summoning pool, but um, I, I I do like this mostly because of the consistency. The challenge with this particular battalion at the moment is that normally when I see bulgur units or normally when I see them used effectively, you've got a unit of six bulgur. You don't often see units of three, which or or you've got two units of three acting independently because you want to avoid battle shock. So, do you take a unit of six and a unit of three? Do you take two units of three with the Ghoul Gore and the Great Great Brave Shaman? And you're probably almost at a thousand points, or or at minimum, you're almost at there with their with the the Doom Bull. So it's a lot of points invested in here, and I guess it's like. 
is the consistency worth it? And and what are you trading off? And probably use putting bodies probably on the rest of the board. So I'd be curious to hear from you folk, especially your beast of chaos people, how you would think about this. Would you run two big blocks of bull gores and just go double down on, on the war herd? You know, having 12 bull gores on the table plus a gorgon, that's that's pretty tasty. Or would you just go MSU and have two units of three? I, I, I don't know, to be honest. I, I, I'm, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit iffy on this one, but I'd love to hear from you, which as always, I would say that, you know, the true list tech is not going to really be uncovered until the frequently asked questions is released. And that's normally four weeks after it hits the shelf, but Age of Sigma 3 is coming. I think I've mentioned it like a million times now. So who knows, one, when the FAQ is going to come out, two, when what Age of Sigma 3 is going to bring and how that's going to change and what mechanics and reactions and battle plans and size of battle and points value. There's just so many things that could be possibly coming. But, you know, ultimately, uh, I've got this Broken Realms Kragnos. I really enjoyed the book. I've only had it for like 48 hours. So I haven't gotten into the weeds. And I've started to think about my Gloom's Flight kits and think about what it could possibly look like with Kragnos. And I think there's some good stuff in there, but it does mean that I'm leaving probably my fanatics at home. Um, but I'm going to play around with some lists. I would love to hear from you what your thoughts are. Are you a cities player? Um, would you take one of the the Vendents? I still think the crossbow is just awesome. Um, uh, Doralina, Doralina, Daryl, Dora, the Explorer, Dora, the crossbow. Um, you know, I think she is going to be a great pick for for cities players. Um, Skaven, I think the warp fire team or the, the war machine teams are going to weapon the weapons teams. The weapons teams are going to be a great addition, especially with your, your two, three, four blocks of clan rats and hiding them and then jumping them out with their short range and maybe relying less on your, your blocks of Gisales or your acolytes. Um, what else? What else? Your Sylvaneth, I think Alariel is an interesting one. I'll be I'll be curious to see how people play with Alariel, but certainly the War Song Revenant. Um, I could see a use for the War Song, but then where do you get your points from? Do you drop Kurnoth Hunters? Are you uh, are you dropping your Tree Lord Ancient or your or your Tree Lord? I I I'll be very curious to do a list discussions, especially with Age of Sigma three, but. It feels like it's going to become the age of heroes, the age of monsters. Certainly, that's what it's looking like so far. And a lot of this fits perfectly into that. But let me know in the comment section where you stand with this. Again, thank you, Games Workshop, for sending this to me in advance. It gave me a, a good couple of days to look over these rules before they hit the shelves. And hopefully you have a better idea of maybe some of the lists that you will build Um from the different armies affected by Broken Realms. And if you enjoyed the video, as always, like, comment, let me know your thoughts. It's always appreciated. I hope you found that discussion valuable. If you did, give the video the old thumbs up. And if you have a comment or an insight, leave it in the comment section below. The champions over here are my AOS Coach Patreons and YouTube members. So you guys are bloody legends. Thank you for all the support. If you want to know more about the support programs, the links are below down here in the episode description, along with the link to the Discord server, so we can continue this conversation. Until next time, don't forget to name your characters and have a good one.